This episode of the podcast has been brought to you by Sweet Cheetah Publicity. Sweet Cheetah is an inclusive, socially conscious PR collective that puts their money where their mouth is. They have a current roster of bands that reads like a greatest hits anthology. Brainiac, Catholic School, Jawbox, The New Amsterdams, Oceans in the Sky. I mean, the list goes on and on. They also do PR for record labels such as A La Carte, Arctic Rodeo, Steadfast, Rad Girlfriend, and so many more. How do they pay it forward? How do they put their money where their mouth is? By generating thousands of dollars in annual charitable donations to the likes of Women in Vinyl, Coalition of Communities of Color, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and many, many more. The man has the receipts. I've seen them. It is real. The artists, labels, and podcasts Sweet Cheetah works with are curated with an eye on working primarily with friends. You can find Sweet Cheetah on all of the social media platforms, be it Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Just look for Sweet Cheetah PR and they will be there. He's been Tim. I've been Peter. And Sweet Cheetah has been beautiful. Hello, folks, and welcome to another edition of the Book of Very, Very Bad Things podcast. I'm your host, Peter, and I am still here. Tonight, I give to you the one and only Matt Pryor. How do we know Matt Pryor? We know him from the Get Up Kids, New Amsterdam's, his solo work. He's been involved in so many musical ventures. But, you know, the story begins with the first Get Up Kids 7-inch and it was like a shot heard around the world in the, uh, the hardcore punk scene. This was when tastes began to shift in the scene, you know? It wasn't just uh, emo or tough, gritty hardcore. There were different shades to paint with, and we were all starting to recognize this. And what the Get Up Kids did so beautifully was they brought out just great rock and roll. They were culling from all these different disparate influences from, you know, Fugazi to to classic rock to uh, so many different things, man. There's so much in the mix of of a great, well-wrought pop song. And that is what they were doing with Aplomb. The Seven Inches, the Split, the Four Minute Mile. um, It just continued to blossom and... You know, I, I, I cover a lot of this ground with Matt, but I, I, I'd be remiss not to mention how undeniably powerful the New Amsterdams are and, and how incredibly gorgeous and bucolic his solo stuff is. Um, it, it's not just your run-of-the-mill Americana that, you know, I used to be in a punk band and now I do Americana thing that it seems to be prevalent now. Um, it... it it's sincere, it's cutting, and it's beautiful. And I hope, if you haven't already listened to it, I hope you all go out after this episode, pick up one of his solo records, and just dig in, because there's so much beauty to behold. With that being said, I don't want to bore you. I give to you Matt Pryor on the Book of Very, Very Bad Things podcast. I look angelic. You do. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely do and uh it matches your voice so even better <laughs> right well i mean i remember growing up in catholic school every picture of of jesus or mary always had the, the halo around their head yeah as as a fellow uh youthful catholic yes absolutely that the, there was that halo and the the you know angelic glow amongst, yeah. the, amongst the uh 
ephemera and it always you know it, it sold the religion to us at least very I get well it sold to somebody <laughs> <laughs> maybe not me but you know there's a I have I have a very long and storied memory of you in my lifetime since 1995 because uh, the Get Up Kids started coming to the Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania area mm. around that time period. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you you played uh, uh, 97 was the first time we were there. Was it 97? Uh, yeah, that, our first tour was in June of 1997. So my first seven inch probably would have been around 96. Yeah, thinking that's when it came out. Yeah. Uh, you, you have did, you to it, did you get it through very distribution or yeah uh, john john dudek and i were very <laughs> close friends yeah so yeah in a minute <laughs> but the Sorry. fact of the matter is is you know you you guys like once you started coming here it was not you, you didn't stop you know what i mean like there was always kind uh, of a yeah a connection here mm -hmm. and I, if I'm not mistaken, you played the same festival that my old band did where uh, Coalesce, Sean Ingram, decided to take the drummer's snare and throw it into the audience. Now, and now it, that's not technically true. It was actually James, who was our old keyboard player, was Coalesce's drummer at the time. Yeah, and James Deweese did it, yeah. Floor Tom that he threw into the crowd and yeah. hit a girl in the head and then... Uh, it, it it turned into a whole like scene rumor thing with like do you hear james like killed a girl at the wilkes that festival and it's so not true he, he just like it was my friend john uh andrusik's girlfriend and well if i remember correctly james went around and basically got her a bunch of merch from all the bands that were playing like yep and was just like really apologetic about it it was it was actually like you know, it was an accident. It's it's not as if you know from forty five feet away you can. Well, he intended he intended to throw it and smash it. He didn't intend to hit anybody with it. No, and 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 to be honest, the entire drum kit got that treatment. Yes, it's, it's not as if it was just like, okay, I'm going to take this and smash yeah. it off a girl's face. And no, it wasn't, it wasn't a malicious thing at all. at all, at all. And like we were kids at the time, all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, you're two years younger than me, but still, we were all kids. I'm 20. Yeah, yeah, I was 22. The, like, it was just a bunch of fun. But uh, what was kind of uh, amazing about that whole thing is, even though it became a scene police issue, mm -hmm. and, and, and your association with Coalesce, it was still all good here. <laughs> you know, because I mean, we didn't do it. <laughs> it wasn't no. Like no, but like your music and Coalesce's music, bulletproof. So if uh, you're making music that good, that it, it makes you bulletproof well, to that. It, it, it's interesting. I think because of that seven inch with Coalesce and our friendship with them, that we kind of became the emo band that hardcore kids are allowed to like somehow. <laughs> Maybe. You know? Yeah, true. And it was like, uh, you know, like people come up to me often and they're just like, yeah, I mean, we were like grindcore kids and we only listen to thrash and like, but we love Red Letter Day. And it's just like, what? <laughs> All right. Well, let's get down to it. If we're going to talk about Red Letter Day, mm. having been a fan from like the first from Woodson and the, the split seven inches, I never considered you an emo band. And there's a great reason for that because you had as much in common with embrace and the other emo adjacent bands like sunny day real estate as you did with new order who you ended up covering who's mm -hmm. one of my all-time favorite bands so in my opinion there's hardcore in you but there's also that that whole indie rock emo amalgamation well, in you but it's also it's also just really really good fucking rock and roll i mean so, that idea you know like it's it's not it's not you know uh, we always considered ourselves an indie rock band um you know coming coming up you know we we we're kind of divided on like like pop punk and and hardcore some of us like it there's certain things that we all agree on you know like Shape of Punk to Come is a fantastic hardcore record, no matter who you ask. Yeah. But I don't love every single Refused record. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah. uh, or, you know, 
face to face's first record is a a masterpiece but it's just like i don't love every single fat records album you know no. um but the stuff that we all agreed on was fagazi super chunk and drive like yehu yeah and, well but we grew up calling it jehu yeah so, we do we all did we yeah all did. <laughs> but i think it's yay i think it's yehu but i don't know maybe it's jehu i don't who the fuck cares yeah it um, doesn't matter but <laughs> And so it was kind of like it wasn't until we put out stuff I think on Doghouse who had like a real like hardcore um, they were kind of part of that Midwestern because they had like Embrace and um, not Embrace Endpoint Endpoint and yeah. by the, I think it was by the grace of God no they were on Initial and and then we got to be friends with the Initial Records guys and it was just kind of like we got lumped in with this hardcore scene and then all of a sudden it was like people were like. So you're straight edge vegan, right? We're like, what? No. no. <laughs> we we, just, we play I'm left of the dial know. rock and roll, and and that's that's kind of how I viewed it. Which Our is what, band is the replacements. Do you think that we're fucking straight edge and vegan? Exactly. Like if you love Paul Westerberger, you're really yeah. a straight edge kid. Like you're living on the fringe at the very least. But that was kind of the hook for, you know when the get up kids came out because it was just a bunch of dudes that obviously loved the replacements obviously loved like you know the the whole fugazi embrace thing the whole dc like angular vibe because the guitars definitely leaned that way but there was uh, a core of songwriting that said to me hey guys we also we're we're really into like no depression like it's one of our favorite records you know what i mean and i felt that and that i saw that a little later actually I, it kind of like i didn't really get into like any sort of americana and country stuff until like really until he started touring and it was just like people would throw it on in the van you know and it was like uh you know i jim and i used to work at a library <clears throat> called the linda hall library it's a science and research library and we were pages where you just listen to headphones all day and go like pick out books in the in the basement. Mm -hmm. I remember that's the first time I heard Wilco. That's the first time I heard Nick Drake because like all the pages would just like tape trade. And I got turned on to so much cool stuff there. <clears throat> but um, yeah, I mean, we just Jim and I both uh, love good, strong melodies. You know what I mean? And um. You know, it's a super, it's a super junk thing. You know, it's just like, it really is. Yeah. Uh, there's a band from, from Lawrence, Kansas called Vitreous Humor. That was a big yep. influence on us that are just like indie kind of archers, a low fee sort of like in nineties indie pop that it's, uh, you know, and that was the kind of stuff that we were into. And that's also how we ended up. Like we had a different like style of a look than a lot of the other people in the scene because we didn't listen to hardcore and we didn't like we didn't grow up on the east coast we like shopped at thrift stores and you know wanted to look like we were in you know a 90s indie rock band <laughs> like we wanted yeah. to be pavement you yeah. know it looked like that so <clears throat> you were writing music that sounded and felt like you gave a shit about the instrument you played and probably liked brian wilson somewhere along the line which is where i was coming from even though i liked hardcore and i liked punk but there was also that part of me that came from the beatles and the beach boys and the rolling stones and and had that anchor to you call it whatever you want uh classic rock it was good rock mm -hmm. and roll good well-written pop music um you never shied away from that as a matter of fact you honed it and made that a strength. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> That's the it, idea. It, it came off that way, but even more so, the lyricism felt bucolic to the point that you were speaking about what could be construed as commonplace, but when in actuality it was seeing the existential in the everyday. Yeah, I mean, that straight up Fagazi ripoff, <laughs> you know, like we're just like, writing so what? yeah no but it's just like that's how i learned how to write and you can say that with like nirvana to a certain degree too of just mm -hmm. like writing like you know um kind of existential poetry for lack of a better word and like just not just putting it all on front street you know what i mean like just kind of being like 
you know, the first time that you learn that waiting room is about being in prison and you're just like, Oh shit, <laughs> that song's so heavy. <laughs> But it, it makes sense <clears throat> once you really break it down yeah. because you, you can, that's the beauty of good songwriting, good lyricism. You can take it and apply it to whatever your situation is. Sitting in the waiting room could be when I was in high school, you know, waiting to go to detention or right. waiting to be reprimanded by your principal well, or a little I, bit later waiting to get put away, uh, you know, because I was a fuck up. But there, there's always that <clears throat> ubiquitous nature to universal songwriting. I think I've had to come around to that uh, as I've gotten older, because I think when I was younger, I would be like, no, that's not what the song's about. <laughs> you know, I just be like, right. and now I realize that like, it is what it's about to me in the same way that it could be about something completely different to somebody else. But if they're getting something out of it, then that's, what's important. Not whether or not they got it, <clears throat> got my a hundred percent, my intention. And then sometimes they wouldn't ever be able to get my intention because the songs are so personal that like, there's no way you could relate to what I'm going through, you know? <laughs> so right. they, you have to find something to apply it to in your own life. But, but that's, that's kind of what's great about it all too, because, no one's ever going to know what you were going mm -hmm. through when you had penned it, when, uh, when the intention was injected into the music. But it was still put out there and people still really reacted to it. I mean, we all know what happened with the first record. I mean, it, it was it had so many legs, you know, four minute mile had so many legs. But in my opinion, you know, seven inches and the first record aside when Red Letter Day came out that was like something there was, there was something in the air when that 10 inch came out. Cause it came out on 10 inch. Uh, it, it was like a, it was its own thing. Well, <laughs> yeah, I agree. There's a definitely a, 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 what's the word? It's not a, like a tonal shift, but it's a, it's a, maybe a songwriting maturity shift. And I think yeah. it's because, uh, that was the first thing that we wrote and released after we had been touring. Yeah. So we had like all that much more, you know, like for as much as Amy is kind of a song about leaving for tour, we hadn't ever gone on tour. It's it's completely fictional because it's just like, we didn't, it's, a, I mean, it, that's just one of those songs. It's just like the chorus rhymes. So that's where you just going to kind of go with it. But, um, you know, uh, things like, you know, one year later, I'm just like, oh, this is like the lyrics are better. The, And then I had also subsequently in that year and a half had learned how to sing, <laughs> you know, which I did not do very well on Four Minute Mile. I, I disagree, but I, I can tell you in, in with a great amount of certainty that on Red Letter Day that the singing became mellifluous to the point where it mellifluous it, nice you would reach you would reach a, a pinnacle where it, it reminded me so much of something that brian wilson would have done which if you put brian wilson on paper is he the best vocalist on planet earth no but can he write a melody absolutely yes yeah. fuck yes and you guys were doing that with so a plum with a plum the other big thing in that, just with the vocals, is I met James and we would sit around. We would drive around to his G pink Geo Tracker and listen to <laughs> listen to music and like write harmony. Like he taught me how to write harmonies, and he taught me about some basic music theory because he had gone to school for that. Mm -hmm. And I think it definitely like you know besides that year and a half of touring going into it like learning this new sort of like songwriting skill, you know, cause like my only like melody and lyric writing, you know, experience before four minute mile was like pop punk stuff. You know what I mean? Like it was just like, which is like, it can, it can be pretty juvenile, <laughs> you know, sure. like, but, uh, but it's all, it's all based on the descendants. So still has a has great pretty, basis which can be pretty juvenile, but, but it has a great basis because they were all 
Mm -hmm. pretty incredible songwriters even when they were kids argument that really the descendants are the first emo band they are the first emo band and then dag nasty is the second yeah i could see that and then you get embrace but like those those first two those two yeah for certain I yeah I go I don't dislike embrace but I'm a rights of spring guy all day long. I, rights of, rights of spring are more uh, almost I I want to say hippie in the best way possible because mm-hmm. they adhered to something that felt more uh, tribal. I could see that. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Em- I think embrace still had the kind of like minor threat hangover like yeah kind of anti-authority sort of like thing going on which. You know, I do, I do like, but isn't like what really speaks to me. You know what I mean? Like yeah. minor th- is kind of the same way. It's just like, no, I, I get it. I like it. You know, I, it's fun to listen to when you're driving real fast, you know, or whatever, yeah. but it's not like, oh man, when I'm really down, I put on minor th- <laughs> you know, and no, I, we, none yeah. of us do that. None of us do that. Yeah, but, but there, there's, uh, it's a building block and it's yeah. an intrinsic building block, but I think you're absolutely right where you take your dag nasty and 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 you go back and and that's kind of what truly is what one would consider emo descendants dag rights of spring and and then you get what people would well then you get into like jawbreaker and sunny day and you know. right but but jawbreaker and sunny day to me are more indie rock i mean that's the thing about this there's no definitive it, it's like it's like the word punk. It means something different to every every individual. You know, right. if you ask somebody like, well, is Sunny Day emo or is Fall Out Boy emo? The answer is yes. You know, <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. They're both they both are to somebody, you know. Yeah, right. But but to us, Sunny Day wins. <laughs> Fall Out Boy's got some good songs. I, I'm no, I'm not saying anything negative against Fall Out Boy, but to like i i you're you know, not i'm 46 look, look I'm, I'm wearing a misfits hoodie yeah like i love the miss if i had only seen the misfits for the first time at riot fest a couple of weeks ago i would have been like who are these fucking clowns and because i fell in love with them when i was 14 yeah that's how all these people who are you know, selling out arenas for my chem right now are are like you know what i mean they're just like not that my not that I'm not trying to put down my, my chem's great. I like them a lot, but uh, it's just sort of like, there's a time and a place for it. And I think that you have to, to get into that kind of like, I don't know, like for the misfits, it's like this horror aesthetic, you know what I mean? Yeah. That, that lyrically doesn't hold up (laughs) real great in 2022. No, except for Uh, hybrid moments and where Eagles dare the rest of it. Mm. Well, where Eagles there has some questionable lyrics in it too. Well, I ain't no goddamn son of a bitch. You better think about it, baby. <laughs> there's, a, there's a rape line in there though, in the lyrics. There, it's weird. There is, there is, but I mean, um, I, it, it's referring more to the film at that point. No, I know, but it's it's still. But it, yeah, it's just yeah. kind of like it's it's just all about kind of context, like whatever you you know got into when you were in your formative years is mm-hmm. you know always going to be important to you and like you know with a lot of those bands getting so popular now like i <clears throat> oftentimes refer to green day as like a gateway drug for punk rock because yeah. it's some 13 year olds first punk rock band and they're just like oh and they cover an operation ivy song it's like oh who's that you know and then you go back and you know that'll lead you to rancid and then that'll lead you to you know yeah you know, and then you, you 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 find your way to Gilman Street and then it becomes something mm-hmm. else. But I think that's also a strength of what the Get Up Kids had done because there's no there's no scene really to kind of tack on to you guys. You, you were free of the strictures of okay, here's uh you know the 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 two degrees of separation to sick of it all. And on the West Coast, here's the two degrees of separation of Op Ivy. Mm-hmm. You guys, you, you were kind of free of that. You know, like, yeah. in, unless and somebody was really thinking like, oh, man, like, how do we get to Omaha from these guys? You know what I mean? Like, no, no one was thinking about like. I mean, the closest thing would probably be Chicago, maybe. But even then, it wasn't like 
<clears throat> we weren't like mathy at all, you know, that yeah. kind of like Chicago mathy guitar thing. Yeah. But no, I think that was just sort of like being from the Midwest. There's no, at least at the time, it's different now with the internet. But like at the time, it was like there was not enough people in any one particular scene to be able to sustain itself as just you know, oh, this is just the hardcore scene or this is just the ska scene or, or it was like we were all, you know, misfits and we were all part of a counterculture. And the only thing that we had in common was that we didn't have anything in common with the normies. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, we would play. It would be a bill that would be like us coalesce the gadgets who are a ska band, nuclear family who's a pop punk band, the breakups who are a lookout style pop punk band, because you have to distinguish between at the time, you know, fat fat epitaph pop punk and lookout pop punk yep uh, just such a stupid thing uh it was the truth though back then it no, really it was, was. It was a very ben weasel kind of way of looking at things but uh <laughs> you know and then it's like when a veil signed to lookout you're just like what the fuck it was like the world exploded you know what i mean it was yeah. just like lookout doesn't have a hardcore band on there like well they're only kind of a hardcore band <laughs> you know they're they're really more of a pop band, but what are you going to do? Anyway, sorry. I no, think. that makes sense, though, because you think of Avail, they had hardcore guitar riffs, mm -hmm. sensibilities, but when you break it down, there was a lot of Bruce Springsteen and a yeah. lot of John Cougar Mellencamp. They fucking covered pink houses, for fuck's sake. You know what I mean? Like, and did it really fucking well. And you just go like, wait a minute. I've heard this song a thousand times. Is this song awesome? <laughs> like, I guess it kind of is. <laughs> sometimes you've got to have somebody put it in context for you. And and that's what's kind of great about where we came from in the, the, the kind of macrame of these disparate yet unified offshoots of punk rock because mm -hmm. we we got to kind of shoot it through our own prisms. You know what I mean? Like you could yeah. love, you could love neurosis and you could love green day and it, they would make sense together just due to association. Yeah. Sound... I, it kind of felt like hardcore had more rules though. Like it, it did less so much like New York hardcore. Cause they were just kind of like, fuck you. We're from New York. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're not from New York. Then you're stupid. Yeah. And, and uh, but it just, it just kind of felt like there was, there were these like kind of, I mean, it's you're not punk and I'm telling everyone, you know, it's just like who gets to decide that? It was just like very scene street there for a bit. But then in KC, it was just like there was nobody to gatekeep. You know what I mean? So there was just like it's just like, well, I guess we're all in charge. I don't know. <laughs> like, It kind of felt that way. And I was jealous of it mm. because even though I'm in the Wilkes-Barre Scranton area of Pennsylvania, which is splitting the difference between east coast and the midwest mm -hmm. we still adhered to the strictures of the new york thing for a while yeah and and then people like you guys came along and people like hot water music came along and changed everything mm. fucking oh. every it was basically the get up kids and, and and hot water music changed the whole landscape because there was there was a lack of adherence to uh, a codification of, of, of a theme. You just did what you wanted to do. It sounded great. And you didn't give a fuck who felt one way or another about it. You just did it. Well, that part of it's true. And it made sense to me. It made a lot of sense to me. But there was an intellect on top of it that kind of topped off the sound. So well, thank you. you You have to wonder, like, who are these guys like that are not only making really great melodic punk inflected, but ultimately great pop music. And why are they so fucking well read? <laughs> you know, where are these guys coming from? Just a um, lot of a lot of Vonnegut. <laughs> Just a lot of Vonnegut on this end, too. And, you know, I probably wouldn't have gotten out of. Uh, junior high school without breakfast of champions but mm. i was few and far between and the only two other people who were into that were also from the hardcore scene for me yeah. so i had a skewed 
idea of what that scene was about because it was intellectuals that I had been in the stratosphere of who came from that. You know, it wasn't a bunch of like weightlifting tough guy types. Yeah, my I didn't really meet a whole lot of the intellectual hardcore types until later. Um, the first couple of times we toured out east, it does seem it was a lot of basketball jerseys and you know headbands and and straight edge tattoos and stuff. And it was just like, right, okay, whatever works for you, dude. I, I think those people embraced you guys as much, though. Yeah, it was weird. <laughs> it was very weird. There uh, was a, there was a time when anything went though. Yeah, and as long as they weren't like being dicks to people at shows then it was it was great yeah because bands like split lip made it in the same scene and they definitely like with the exception of the guitar work wasn't they weren't hardcore at all N no I, I agree but um to kind of like move it into a different avenue mm. once you know you'd gone through that and things started to really blossom free for uh the get up kids a lot of eyes got on you guys really really quickly and you build to this crescendo and it kind of just the bubble pops right and it feels like to me it felt like to me you guys just said you know what fuck this shit and then uh, the new uh, well, at, at what point are you talking about I, I, the point I'm talking about is like right after like you're on uh, Vagrant for a while and then things just kind of like build to a mass. I don't I don't know what it is for you guys because I'm not intimately involved, obviously, but you're, you're getting you're building momentum. You're getting bigger. And then it just goes radio silence. And then the new Amsterdam's happen. And I start to get this uh, this entire other energy from you that I'm having been a Wilco fan and anything Ryan Adams, which he's a dirty word now, but back then... I mean, he's a with, dick, but he's still a good songwriter. Yeah, dude, Whiskey Town was fantastic, <laughs> but, you, you know, even his solo stuff, like, up to a point was really, really well done. But it seems like you were embracing that and, and and like so many other amazing different things that were like obviously like within our purview, having come from an independent music scene. You were taking that on, but not straying so far off that it's not like, well, oh, that's not really Matt Pryor. Like it was it still felt like you. It still sounded like you, but it was it was just informed from it was informed by different and amazing things that it never felt like a, a, a pose or a flex. It was just, this is where I'm at now. Well, but, yeah, but it was, it was at the time. It was also, this is where I'm at as well. Like mm -hmm. it, was, it wasn't meant to be like one or the other. And I actually didn't know <clears throat> that everyone else had gotten as much into, um, more classic rock on their end and more singer songwriter stuff on my end. Um, and so like after I did the first new Ams record is when we went in to make on a wire. And then there's a couple of songs on on wire that were supposed to be new Ams songs. And mm -hmm. like, cause I didn't, the whole point of new Ams was just like, well, I don't think these are get up kids songs cause they're acoustic and folky and, and you know, I want to have, pedal steel on stuff you know like i wanted to like try things and uh and then it turns out that like everybody was kind of open to that that kind of experimentation uh at the time too and people are way more <laughs> well they're accepting of on a wire now but they were way more accepting of the new first new ams record than they were of on a wire when it came out see my experience was everybody went ape shit over on a wire nope <laughs> they, they, where but let me explain a little bit more about the Wilkes-Barre area then, I guess. We were always, once we had adhered to a band and a sound, we didn't give too much of a shit about whether or not they 
were writing the same record over and over again, as long as it was good and the same people we were on that. We were cheerleaders for that. We were very much into that. So when on a wire came out, everyone I'd known, we were all in call. This was college years for me at this point. We're all like, fuck yeah, man, this is, this is. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of split the scene a bit, you know, cause it's like on the one hand we had gotten to a point of popularity where, uh, we had younger fans and then we had like fans who were kind of genre specific. Um, mm -hmm. and it wasn't, it, it kind of started to feel like it wasn't all people who were into music as much as it was people who liked the music, but were kind of in it for the scene. Yeah. And those are the people who are kind of like, you know, the soaks, you know, like what it, how could this band have made something at home about? And I'm like, well, cause we already made something at home about and we wanted to do something different. So yeah. Shut the fuck up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I always say like <clears throat> with, with wire, we're not in hindsight, completely happy with how it came out. Uh, we think a lot of the songs are really good. I always say that it's, that record's not great front to back, but the good songs on it, are some of the best songs we've ever written. Um, but some of it's a little bit neutered. You know what I mean? Like it's supposed to, it's like a, something that, like a song like Wish You Were Here, which when we play it live, we make it sound like the replacements. And then on the record, it sounds kind of wimpy. You know, it's just sort of. The mix uh, isn't thick enough for you guys for that, for that material. No, and it was the first time that we had written a record that we hadn't toured at all. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So we didn't have any like, audience feedback as far as like oh yeah like this is you know like <clears throat> like we played m other than a handful of songs on something at home about we had played a lot of them live uh the previous year uh certainly the like Dottie and holiday and action and stuff like things that were like we're like okay people are reacting to these you know yeah. and we know this is gonna work um but yeah i mean I like Wire better now when we play those songs than I actually like the record itself, which is actually how I feel about Four Minute Mile too. <clears throat> actually, I think that's how I feel about all of our records. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think if I were to try to kind of uh, explore the emotional or uh, in just where you were at at that point in your life with any record cycle, which Red Letter Day, I would I absolutely love to know where you were at. But on a Wire... I think that's probably the more interesting, you know, uh, psychological profile. Where were you at there when you were diving into this, which is the absolute paradigm shift for you guys? Like, where were you at there? Like, what, what was your mindset? Um, it was to not. So in the one hand, we were, we were taking off, we were putting on some handcuffs and taking off other handcuffs. And so we were just like, okay, every time we get asked to do like a cover for a comp or something, all we do is do like a halftime ending or octave chords or, <clears throat> you know, Wii U, Wii U keyboard stuff. Yeah. And uh, so we're like, okay, we're not going to do any of that. So we're going to put those handcuffs on. But at the same time, we're like, we're not going to be afraid of just like, okay, this song's acoustic guitar driven the song is just hammond organ instead of a moog you know this is um, you know uh, i brought a bunch of instruments to the studio that we didn't end up using but it was just um you know just like we want to like not be afraid to like try different things and like try and sound kind of more like a rock and roll band and less like a punk rock band a little bit but yeah. still retain us but <clears throat> i think we went a little too far with it i think we could have done a better job with it but to me it felt like you were you were in don't tell a soul mode yeah, well, yeah maybe i don't know well think about it think about the replacements versus you guys if, if we're talking about like tonal shifts that's don't tell a soul i believe uh the guy we made on a wire with made that record if I'm not mistaken, who here, I'm looking it up. This Don't is going to be an interesting soul. 
replacements producer this makes for good radio yeah it does <laughs> <laughs> okay so that was matt wallace never mind okay what did uh what when did scott lit do oh he did he do all shook down who produced all shook down uh, all shook down i don't know if that was scott lit that's scott lit yep it was uh-huh no shit <laughs> That's All fun. Shook Down is also a good record, but it is. It is. It, it wasn't that far of a departure from Don't Tell a Soul. That's true. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't belie the point, though. There's a, a distinct shift between, you know, in the in the replacements, uh, you know, kind of arc story arc. Same with you guys. Once we get into that territory, I think it starts to make everything that you had done thereafter make a lot more sense yeah. uh, even more so with your solo stuff because it's a great kind of introduction to where your head was at and you know incorporating the more of the pedal steels and and things of that nature you you wanted to get into more traditional songwriting tropes you still made uh, them your own yeah I guess so. I don't really like using tropes, but um, I see what you mean. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not using tropes as in like you know trying to belittle anything. I, I'm not feeling it that way. To me, it's it's like you, you're trying to integrate something that had happened prior to you, and making it a part of your arsenal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And well, it, I was just, I was listening to different stuff too. You know what I mean? And I wanted to be able there's an element of it that I wanted to be able to do something by myself where I didn't have to be dependent on having this loud band behind me because I'd started seeing people perform who were able to like to command a room just with an acoustic guitar and their voice. And I was just like, it's, it's an impressive feat whenever you can see somebody do it. I, I can't do it all the time. I can carry my own on a stage by myself, but like it, it's, you know, you go see Julian Baker play these days and it's like she can get the whole room to just completely shut the fuck up for an hour just with her. You know, it's amazing. But I, I think that as far as what's on record, uh, you know, obviously there's studio work going on. But with your solo stuff, I, I hasten to call it Americana because it, that's not it. It's not really it. That's just a kind of a lego piece in the in the greater you know i mean so americana seems to be anything that has an acoustic guitar right more prominently than an electric guitar or if it's twangy oh yeah this, it has a little it's americana no it's 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 somebody who's writing you know acoustic based rock oriented you know like you can yeah, call I think it it's really just about the instrumentation honestly right. and, and that you're allowed to get older yeah it's, you know the only the only uh, modern, you know, maybe country music a little bit. Well, no, country music is kind of pop driven now, but like that allows, like that celebrates the legacy acts. You know what I mean? Like that yeah. it's just like, oh, you know, Willie Nelson is, you know, an American hero. You know what I mean? Like it's not like, oh, that old guy with the braids. Like, <laughs> but like to me, uh, like somebody says Americana. And that sounds like, you know, the old like punk hardcore guy retirement home because they they traded in their like Earth Crisis basketball cool. jersey in the in the backwards new era for, you know, uh, a, a Gatsby cap and a flannel. And it becomes something else that's lazy. So one time I was in Germany and <clears throat> we always called Germany the land of unwanted opinions. And. <laughs> This guy goes, why do all the emo singers become hard or become country singers? And I was like, well, every year at the convention, me and Chuck and Caraba get together and we decide what genre we're going to go into next. And they go, <laughs> they're like, really? And I was like, no. <laughs> Just like, it's like I, fucking social distortion covers Johnny Cash. Like fucking read a book. You yeah, know, like, 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 get a little informed on the scene. We were never that far from Hank Williams Sr. No, absolutely not. 
And, and I've become yeah. obsessed with George Jones lately. Because George of, Jones is phenomenal. <clears throat> have you listened to Cocaine and Rhinestones? Yes. Yes. That whole, I was just like, like I literally was like, we were, I was going in to record vocals for something. And I was like, guys, I've been listening to a lot of George Jones. You're going to have to tell me if I'm trying to do too much George Jones. Because <laughs> I'd be like, uh, it's like going like big, deep scoops with stuff. And it was just like. It, it just I'm just obsessed with him because he's he's punk as fuck. I mean, he just absolutely did not give a shit about anybody. No. And still had, and had all the anxieties that I had. <laughs> and furthermore, had the same kind of, you know, story arc, like started out here, ended up here. Like he didn't exactly adhere to the same formula from beginning of career to where he ended up. I haven't and. Been- a lot about like the the parallels between like early emo and con- and like kind of like classic country in that like there was always a, there's a scene for it it makes money people come see it and it can't get good press to say to save a lick you know what i mean yeah like i don't know if we're actually going to do it but i really kind of want to so we're going to do a 25th anniversary tour for something at home about in 2024. And I, somebody had the idea. And I think it's amazing that our banner, our backdrop should just be the pitchfork review of that record that came out in 1999. Oh God. Cause it's two out of 10. <laughs> Where the, I, what were they fucking thinking? But anyway, I, they've <laughs> always hated us. Uh, they, it just, I don't think well, I don't know if we'll actually do it, but it's just such a it'd be such a fuck you. It'd be funny. I I think that they are the most clueless publication on planet Earth. I have no comment. I have a lot of comments because Pitchfork has completely shit on for every five to ten years. Every album that happened within that time span, like like every couple of years, there's a couple records that are really like important to the greater zeitgeist of let's not even say scenes but to underground music at large they've shit on or completely written off all of those records all of them with the exception of the refused yeah well. one album they got one album in 30 years did they like the promise ring i don't remember no no no, they absolutely no. The the first Promise Ring record, they did not. They did not. If they did, I'll eat my hat. <laughs> well, um, let's not let's not waste any more time on Pitchfork. I thought yeah. it was it was Fuck just that. more kind of like thinking about like the whole like you know, oh, I sold out this we sold out this theater and and it just like you stop at a gas station and people are like, oh, I haven't heard of you. You know, it's just like, well, all right, that's not for you. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but but the further beyond that, I don't think the press has ever really taken good care of of our scenes. You know, like uh, it, yeah, they made, I, they made money off of us for certain, for certain, but they didn't well, serve us. You know, I don't, I don't know that it's that black and white. I can, I totally understand that 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 feeling. Um, there's it's you know it's 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 a complicated thing when you're dealing with you know music journalism because it's still opinion based it's not there's nothing like you can't be factual about it because it's all like art is subjective you know and one man's trash is another man's treasure so it's just like every time one of those top 40 emo albums of all time comes out and there's always one on there that you're like them you know (laughs) yeah uh you know, it's just kind of like, but it's like to that person that was like I was saying before, like to that person, that's an important band to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, uh, I just always look at those lists and try to make sure that we're ahead of saves the day. <laughs> <laughs> they had two good records. They have a lot of good records, actually. But but are but do they are they? I don't know. I, I have my opinions on that. Um, their first record was Lifetime. Their second record was really good. And then everything else lost me. But that's just because... My favorite w- Saves the Day record is In Reverie. 
I think that's that is a well crafted intellectual pop record. Yeah, and I I stand by that. Yeah, but it's is is it also the Beatles? Yes. Yeah, but every band has to go through their Beatles phase. You know what I mean? Like sure. eventually even punk kids discover the Beatles and they discover Led Zeppelin and they go like, oh, let me try that. You know, like right that. And then all of a sudden you've written, you know, something that sounds like George Harrison. Yeah. And I don't want to shit on them too much because I'd love to have them on. But um, <laughs> <laughs> there's there's that part of me that just thinks, you know. I, 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 I've heard it. I've heard this. I've heard this. Whereas everything you've done, and I'm not just, you know, being a sycophant, everything you've done, I've found something in it that took me to a place that I, I wanted to, not only did I want to go, but I enjoyed going there. And I didn't feel that it was that, uh, you know, referential that you were pandering, you know, it felt authentic every time. Well, thank you. My pleasure. And it, and it the is. reason the reason I feel this way is because in my opinion you did come from a very authentic place within yourself and and gave us something that w- was very authentic to you. That's why the Get Up Kids always to me hit in a great way. New Amsterdam's your solo stuff. It, it always stirred something in me that felt like it hit a a concrete center that not everybody hit for me, you know, and, and your solo stuff was really, really, that hit me in a, in a place that nothing else really did Mm. because it, 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 I I can hear like, Hey, he likes T-Rex, doesn't he? Hey, he, you know, he, th- this guy, he, he likes George Jones. He likes Johnny Cash. He likes, mm. you know, th- there's, there's a lot to kind of unpack there. And it, it reminds me of my own upbringing with these disparate and, and rich and wonderful experiences with my parents' music and my grandparents' music and my cousins before me who turned me on to, you know, thrash metal and punk. Uh, like it, it all kind of washes out. Mm-hmm. and makes sense and and becomes a part of something greater than all of us well once you kind of make the realization that like you uh, like a pop song is a pop song and no matter what you <clears throat> like you can make a country version of a britney spears song and i'm sure people have people have made country versions of get up kids songs there's an australian band that did a, a full twangy version of red letter day and it was awesome mm-hmm. and uh you know and so once you kind of like unlock that particular you know chest you know and you like kind of let your mind be free there then you're just like oh yeah i can uh, you know and then also to just not be like oh you can't put pedal steel on that this isn't a country record just like but it sounds cool you know yeah. like who gives a shit like when, there's a there's a bit on uh on the last record on problems that in the middle of it it's got a uh harpsichord in it it's a harpsichord. Sand. It's not that we didn't get an actual harpsichord, but it's like the din, 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 din. it sounds like Victorian era. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, I don't know that I like this. And they were like, picture. A, what's what's a Beatles song that has one of those in it? Uh, is it Eleanor? No, Eleanor Rigby is just a string quartet. Yeah. Uh, and once they put it in that context, which is like, oh, OK, yeah, that makes sense to me. And now it, it sounds really cool in the song. But initially, I was just like, are we just doing that? being weird for the sake of being weird you know but it actually sounds pretty cool uh, i i never i never found anything that you you had done to be weird for the sake of it because it was always tasteful but i do have a lot of uh a lot of examples of people doing weird things for the sake of it i mean you, never... could, make, you could make the argument that rules is a little bit weird for the sake of being weird but i think the songs are good I and like rules. It wasn't it wasn't really like we all still really like it a lot. To us, it's not really that weird, but it was just kind of like going <clears throat> like again, like taking off those handcuffs and just being like, I I mean, that's kind of wild. Yeah, fuck it. Let's try it. You know, like it's you know, like you come up like there's no bad ideas until until there are, you know, and then you're like, you know, there's a song on that record that doesn't have any guitars in it at all. And I'm just like, I don't know. 
it's a great song, but it's just like it's strange. And then there's that uh Birmingham song that Jim sings that sounds like Reggie. It's just like all synth, and we're just like, Yeah, I don't know, guys. It sounds like Reggie, and then they go, He's in the band. So yeah, like, like James I, was in the band. Like, what the fuck? Why not? That, yeah, I guess that makes sense. We should probably just especially because when we like when we did wire, he wasn't really allowed to to like flex at all. He's just a lot of organ. <laughs> that that's its own other thing, but yeah. y- you know, there there has to be kind of like a, a, a spot though, I think, where you hit that eureka moment where you were the first iteration of yourself in the get up kids and decided I'm capable of this, 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 you know, the, this list of things that I, I can do this unfettered of whatever anyone thinks of me. And it's, it's kind of that point that I'm really interested in getting to, like I said, the, cons- the conceit of this show is legitimately, you know, that, that emotional intellectual eureka moment that that point where you decided okay i'm not just this guy i can do all this other stuff you you Uh, know what i mean i'm interested in that point i there's two two the times that come to mind uh one is on our our very first tour because our first tour was just supposed to be three weeks out with braid over the summer break because um ryan had graduated from high school Jim and Rob were in, in college. I had tried college and didn't like it. And it was just like, all right, we're going to do this for the summer. Maybe this for this one tour and then go back to school. <clears throat> and I remember we were driving through Rhode Island. I look over to Rob and I'm like, I think we could probably do this for, you know, a little while longer. And every he was just like, yeah, I agree. Like everybody was just like, school will always be there, you know. <clears throat> so that was kind of an aha moment. And then I, I would say that the other one is, isn't really a light bulb going off as much as it's a gradual kind of realization of like putting in your 10,000 hours of something as a songwriter. Well, as a performer and as a songwriter, um, as a performer, even if I'm having like a panic attack because of something else, I suffer from anxiety. So even if I'm having like, you know, I'm backstage and I'm freaking out as soon as I walk on stage, it's just something I just go like, all right, plant your feet you know, do your thing. Um, as a songwriter, I think it's when I somewhere realized that I write, I have, I've got much more control over my voice and my vocal range just from doing it for so long. And I've become really fast at writing lyrics. Um, and I just kind of like knock things out. Uh, and so I just kind of like, like, and and even when we're like writing songs together, I'll just be like, okay. So I'll be like humming a melody in my head while we're trying to like play, you know, the bridge of a song. And I'd be like, no, do it, do it three times. Don't just do it three times, not two, not four, just do it three. And they're like, do you think it should be four? And I'd be like, no, nah, it's going to work better for the melody if it's just three. And I can in, intuit that, you know what I mean? And I think that just comes from practice. That really just comes from, you know, having written thousands of songs and, and having, you know, uh, also having worked with these guys for so long, you know, as much as we fight, we we do have a telepathy for the most part, except when we're really drunk. And then we're. Just- <laughs> <laughs> but that co- that comes from, you know, that your 10,000 hours, as the book says, mm-hmm. you know, where you're practiced and you do have that shorthand. Mm-hmm. But um, what's the second of the two, really? Um, <clears throat> that that is your um aha moment, like oh, the- just it's just like lately in life of just like kind of realizing that I'm a I'm a good songwriter. You know what I mean? Like it's just like uh, and also just to kind of like step back and be like, you know, I don't have to worry about the synth sounds, and I don't have to worry about. <clears throat> the drum part because i know that the other guys have that taken care of and so the the <clears throat> the secret of the stew that is you know the the voltron that is this band is that we're all good at our particular areas you know and it's like 
<clears throat> I mean, we do step on each other's toes sometimes because we're we've been playing together since we were teenagers, but <clears throat> we we try, you know, to be we've just all kind of learned what our strengths are. So I think that so, answers your question. It does because it's trust. Mm. Yeah, and and that's really what it breaks down to. You you've developed uh not only a shorthand but a trust. And that's that's beautiful. Um and maybe that's the journey you had to take beyond being in the get up kids, you know, doing new Amsterdam's doing your own thing. You, you had to kind of like get your own sea legs in order to come, come back to the thing you started with when you were a teenager, you know, well, the, the best example of that is our last record problems because it's very yeah. much like, okay, so what like we this was like the mission statement it was just like what if the guys who made something to write home about wrote a record with 20 years more ex more life experience and that's what that record is and that's why it's pretty good <laughs> you know that? yeah more than pretty good hmm. <clears throat> and that leads me into you know i have my only format is one question and Normally I ask it first, but you know, you and I hit the ground running in a really special way. So I didn't even bother, but I asked, you know, Chris from braid the same question and his circumstances, like God bless him. I love him. I love Chris so much and he's been through so much and yeah. he was through even more since our episode together. Uh, what is it that terrifies you on an existential level? Um, it, it's a bit, uh, death and like serious injury, um, it's interesting too, because like, <clears throat> like my daughter wants to be a mortician mm -hmm. and my wife works in the metal medical field and is really interested in like kind of macabre. <clears throat> morbid morbid stuff and it's not for me i respect it i want i want to not be uncomfortable with it but i think there's a level of having to let go of control of your own life to be able to accept you know your your mortality that kind of scares the shit out of me that yeah. and losing my voice losing my voice scares the absolute shit out of me if i'm on tour and you know, even right, like right now, I'm a little bit groggy just because I just got done with tour and it's my body catching up to me. Yeah. If I had to play a show tonight, I would be pretty nervous right now. I'd be just chugging water and not talking. Yeah. Yeah. Saving the voice. But um, the, the, no matter what answer I get, it always breaks down to kind of like really two or three things. And that is you know, grievous bodily harm, the end of everything and, uh, you know, disappointment of family, everything else is a derivation of that. I've heard, I've heard like, like I, I hasten to use, uh, you know, Chris Broach as an example again, but he and I had the same existential fear, which is like, you know, the things that kind of take place outside of the known universe, which is the unknown, which kind of lies in the vicinity of death. Mm -hmm. Right. It's the same shit. It's just yeah. a different, it's a different hat. Um, that's what makes us human. That's why I ask it just because like, it sounds trite. It sounds like a cheesy thing, but in all actuality, it's what makes us human. The humanity, it lies within the fear of the end of humanity. You know, and unless yeah. you're really blinded by some kind of faith in uh, uh, a legend, which which I'm not, um, yeah, uh, I don't know. It's a weird, it's, yeah. I think what kind of sets apart the musician from the or the artist on a greater scale than the non-artist is artists get to leave behind a legacy that will last long thereafter yeah it's an it's, it's a it's a weird concept to wrap your head around as right 
making the making the art. It's just sort of like, uh, I mean, besides the fact that there's music, there's like thousands of hours of interviews of me. You know, mm -hmm. uh, my great grandkids can listen to it. Well, this is a, this is assuming my kids ever want to have children, which I don't think that they do. <laughs> so, uh, you know, um, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. It's a little too uh, heady for me to wrap my head around because I just kind of like my wife was like, you mean, I was just like, just cremate me and throw me in the sea. That's me. That's and she's me. Like, she's like, no, like people need to have a place where they can come and say something to you because you your your work means something to people and i'm just like uh, i mean i understand that for like important people <laughs> you know or just like right but i mean i'm just in a band man but but in actuality the people who don't know you who are not a part of your orbit if they want to visit you just go listen to the record because that's where you are. That's where you really are. Yeah. I don't know. It's not up to me. I, the only person's grave I've ever, like, ever gone to see was Jim Morrison's in Paris. And mm -hmm. it was just like, and it's just, it's more because the, the cemetery was cool. You know, yeah. nothing against Jim Morrison, but I didn't, like, fly to Paris to go to his grave. No. I just, ha I happened to be there for work. <laughs> Still something to see, though, because... You know, in all honesty, that that's someone who has had a vast effect, whether we like it or not, on the music we love. Yep, totally. No Jim Morrison, no Iggy Pop, no Iggy Pop, no punk. True. You mm -hmm. know, but um, it's it's not about that resting place. It's not about where the remains land. That's well, ultimately. It'll be my wife's decision what <laughs> happens with right. yeah, but as as with my wife, you know, and being 46 years old and having hit the family reset button because I have a 22 year old daughter and a three year old son. Oh boy. Yeah. I uh you know, I'm at the mercy of what she wants to do, but it just so happens that my wife feels the same way that I do. That's good. Where your body lands means nothing. You know, it's where you keep that person and, and what they've done in life that echoes into eternity. You know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> to, to, to get really like grandiose about it. But, um, well, I, I think that's probably a good place to end it. Because <laughs> <And> <laughs> we're going to talk about the end of your life and I have to pee really, really bad. <laughs> so, okay. So let me, I'm not going to hold you up. I'm so glad you came on tonight. Your music has meant the world to me since I was, you know, in my early twenties and the next time you have something out, I would love to have you on again, Matt. Okay. I would uh, love to love to do it. All right, my brother. Cheers, man. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye now. All right, folks, that was Matt Pryor. This has been an incredible journey, uh, making this podcast, getting to talk to people I've been an admirer of, a fan of, for so many years, back into my youth. Um, I love the Get Up Kids. I love the New Amsterdams. I, I, I love everything Matt does musically. He's got one of those voices that's just so unique, and everything he writes about is so personal and, and so relatable. Everything he writes about is very relatable to me. Um, this has just been one hell of a journey and I couldn't be more appreciative to Matt. Um, I couldn't be more appreciative to my publicist who makes a bunch of this happen for me. And, uh, I'm just, I'm a happy kid. What can I say? I'm a happy 46 year old kid. So with all that being said, uh, Halloween doth approach. And I have some surprises for that very day for you all. So just stay tuned to this space and get ready for a creepy Halloween special. 
I hope everyone's taking good care of one another. I hope you've got your kids' costumes ready to go. I hope you have yours ready. I hope you didn't buy it from some spirit of Halloween shop. I hope you made it at home, saved money, and had fun experiencing what Halloween is supposed to be about. You're not supposed to dress up like uh, uh, My Little Pony or uh, Ninja Turtle. It's supposed to be creepy, people. Keep it creepy. Keep it creepy. I've been Peter. He's been Matt. You've been beautiful. Good night, everybody, from 3.33 a.m. Studios. This has been the Book of Very, Very Bad Things podcast. Good night, all.